that Leanne, my wife, had a pretty intense experience this week. If you get our church emails, I guess maybe that's a bit of an understatement. Uh, you, many of you probably know my wife has epilepsy, and we generally have that under a pretty solid control through medication, but on Wednesday, while she was driving home on 347, she had a seizure on the I-10, or after exiting the I-10 on 347 while driving. And a man named Joe witnessed the whole thing from behind her and sort of related the details of the story to us. Joe said that Leanne swerved through the two lanes of traffic going in the same direction she was driving, down through the median into oncoming traffic, and then back across the median into her lanes before taking a hard right turn and shooting out into the desert 200 yards in the dark. And uh, when I got to the scene, the car was so far off the road, I couldn't even see it from where I was at on the side of the road. And Joe turned out to be quite a good Samaritan because all the other people around just went about their business, uh, rushing to and fro on the 347. But Joe actually drove his truck out into the desert in pursuit of my wife in an effort to to try and save her life, uh, for all he knew. And I can't help but think of just the grace of God in preventing my wife from slamming into somebody uh, going full speed in the opposite direction or rolling the van while swerving about wildly. And that alone seems miraculous to me. But uh, the story, I think, is more amazing because I can't think of anybody more qualified to be the first person on the scene than this guy, Joe. Because the average run-of-the-mill Good Samaritan Joe just happened to be an EMT. How crazy is that? With just the right set of skills to be the perfect person on the scene. I mean, I see just the mercy of God all over this story, right? God's kindness, for sure. Uh, So Joe calls 911. The doors of the car are locked, so he smashes out the back window. He unlocks the vehicle and begins to give my wife first aid while he waits for the ambulance to arrive. And as awful as as this situation is, it, it turns out really to be a pretty incredible illustration as we start this new series that we're going into on evangelism. And I hate to be an opportunist, but it really fits quite well. Think about it. Joe took the time to chase down my wife into the wilderness when her life was at risk while everybody else was too busy to get involved. Not only that, but Joe had a very unique set of skills which applied perfectly to the situation at hand some medical training that made him really invaluable in that moment. And again, while everybody else went about their business, Joe actually cared enough in that moment to take responsibility for the life of my wife, a total stranger, and actually minister to her in her time of need. Now, I do believe that just about anybody in this room in a moment like that would probably be a lot like Joe. But when you take this story and you move it from the physical realm into the spiritual realm, how many of us are like Joe? I mean, think about it. People all around us are in actually far worse danger than even my wife was as she sat in that wrecked car in the middle of the desert. They're wrecked because of their sin. They're wrecked because of their distance from God. They're wrecked because their eternal soul hangs in the balance. And we, like Joe, as Christians, with the gospel, the good news of Jesus, are uniquely qualified to help them, to save them. Because we have this gospel of Jesus Christ, the only salvation available to mankind. We have the good news of grace that comes through Jesus Christ so that those who put their trust in him might pass from death to life and be rescued from their sin. The problem is, though, we're often just too busy or too concerned with our own lives 
that we don't engage in this saving work of Jesus' rescue, right? We might be a Joe on the road, but are we a Joe in our neighborhood? And what could be more important than the people of God lifting up the glorious salvation of Jesus Christ to a world in peril? Really, does anything compare in worth or importance or value to that? What in our daily lives as we go about them as busy as we are have more significance or more importance than pursuing people with the gospel of hope as their souls are in danger? So we're going to spend the next couple of weeks in this series on evangelism that I'm calling Bless. And the kids, too, are going to be engaging in some of this as well. So you can be sure that if you have little ones at home, they will be holding you accountable to what you learn in this room so that our families are all on the same page. But what I want to try and do through the next couple of weeks is is really twofold, okay? First, I want to offer you a very simple strategy for evangelism. Maybe you sit here and you're like, I would love to share the good news of Jesus. I just don't know how. Well, I want to give you a simple strategy for how you can be a spiritual Joe in somebody else's life, seeking after people whose lives are wrecked, lost in the wilderness, And that strategy is blessed. It's that little thing in your bulletin, a bookmark or a card that you can put on your fridge. Begin with prayer. Listen with care. Eat together. Serve in love. And share your story. Bless those around you. Which is why I've stuffed that in your bulletin, so hopefully it'll find its way into your Bible or maybe onto your fridge. The second thing that I hope to do, and we're going to get into the, the, the strategy more in the weeks ahead, but the second thing that I hope to do is really just stir your heart in this series, in the weeks ahead. I want to try and sow a burning conviction in your heart and your soul that the missionary work of evangelism is what Christians who love Jesus should be doing. I want to fan into flame a burning desire in your heart to be like Joe, willing to take a detour from your normal daily routine, the normal parts of your life, into the work that God has called us to do to share the gospel, the good news with those around us. And I want us to feel this burden together because I think that it's a burden that Jesus himself has given to us to carry out for his sake, out of love for him. So we're going to delve deeper into the strategy more next week. This morning, I only want you to see and kind of understand that the whole point of the church that Jesus has established is to carry on the work that he began in bringing this gospel of good news to the world. I want you to see that we have been blessed with the gospel so that we might be a blessing to our community, particularly to Maricopa. And friends, think about this. Christ has taken our nature into heaven to represent us before the Father. And he left us with his nature here that we might represent him to the world. So let me pray to this end and then we'll press on. God, I recognize that only you can do this work. And Lord, I pray that as we talk about this over the next couple of weeks and this morning, that you would just pour out your grace and your power and your Holy Spirit upon your people. That we would catch a vision for this, not because I'm shaming people from the pulpit or leading them to feel bad about themselves, but because this is what you have given us to do. And it's beautiful, and it's precious in your eyes. And you've empowered us for this work that you will complete. So Lord, would you, just, would you change our hearts to love and to be about the same things that you love and are about? And I pray that you would do this for your glory. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I've got a lot of scripture that I'm going to tackle this morning. I'm going to be just peppering it at you on the screen behind me because I want to persuade you that the whole point of the church is to really just carry on the ministry of Jesus, seeking and saving the lost. 
But I want to fundamentally ground that idea in this. It is for the glory of God. It is for the glory of God that we go about the work of evangelism. Christians are called to do evangelism, to share the gospel in love for our neighbors for the glory of God. And if we neglect this work, we actually neglect the glory of God. Christians are motivated to tell people about Jesus for his glory. As the Puritan preacher Richard Baxter put it, we have greater work here to do than merely securing our own salvation. We are members of the world and church, and we must labor to do good to many. We are trusted with our master's talents for his service in our places to do our best to propagate his truth and grace and church and to bring home souls and honor his cause and edify his flock and further the salvation of as many as we can. All this is to be done on earth for the glory of God in heaven. We find a picture of our completed work, I think, in Revelation 19.1, where it says this. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. I bet it's a little raucous, isn't it, Ron? A little crazy. Well, I think this verse tells us two important things, okay? First, Heaven's going to be populated with a great multitude of people. People from many tribes and nations, neighborhoods and families, school districts and cities, races, ethnicities, countries and subcultures. God continues to labor in his saving work, patiently enduring the sinfulness of mankind because he wants to fill heaven with the voices of people who recognize and proclaim his glory. Beautiful. Everyone saved is saved for the glory of God, that they might proclaim just how wonderful he is. And the second thing I want you to see in Revelation 19.1 is that it specifically connects the praises of the people of God with God's salvation. These people are praising God because God has saved them. They declare his glory in salvation. They're not giving God the glory that is already his by right, please understand. Rather, they are simply recognizing and praising God for the particular glory that God has claimed for himself in the salvation of mankind. What I'm getting at is that this verse helps us understand that God is greatly glorified through the salvation of the cross. That's why Christ died. That's why God saved anyone at all. For his glory. Not because we deserved it, but for his glory. And God wants ultimately more people praising him forever for the work of Jesus Christ in saving people. More people saved through his work. More people brought into his kingdom. More people redeemed under the name of Christ Jesus. More people glad and rejoicing for the cross of Christ. More people recognizing the awesome grace and kindness of our God. More people seeing the glory of God in his beautiful plan of salvation, giving to an undeserving people. And so if we're passionate about God receiving all of the glory that he deserves, then we have to be passionate about filling heaven with more voices of those who are redeemed by the grace of God. The salvation of the lost brings great glory to Jesus. And the call of Christians is to give God more glory through the work of evangelism, proclaiming the saving power of Jesus Christ. And let me just say here, man, if you are here this morning and for some reason you don't know this Jesus, I beg you, I invite you right now to come to him for salvation. That you would be redeemed out of your sins. 
So that's our foundational motivation for the work of evangelism. It's the glory of God, but it's not our only motivation. Open your Bible with me to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Uh, If for some reason you don't have a Bible and you want one, I'm sure uh, Chris or John, Chris will bring you one if you want to throw your hand up. No shame. We're glad you're here and we want you to have a Bible. So Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to look at verses 16 through 20. While you're turning there, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, the other motivation that we have for doing evangelism is obedience to Jesus. If we truly love Jesus, we will be evangelistic people. We can't do anything but proclaim his saving work because saving people is what Jesus loved to do, what he came to do, and it's the task that he gave for us to finish. So let me read this, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. There's a few things I want you to see here, okay? First, notice verse 17. The disciples give glory to Jesus. They worship him. That's what they do. They worship him because he was dead and now he's alive. And through his death and resurrection, he has won their salvation. They are giving God glory for Jesus Christ. And they're setting the stage for the worship that will take place for all eternity in heaven that we just looked at in Revelation 19. Second, notice, Jesus passes on to them his authority. He authorizes the disciples as representatives of the church to destroy the kingdom of Satan on earth through this mission of spreading the gospel, the good news. Setting free those who are captives to sin and death. To say that another way, Jesus entrusts his power as King of kings and Lord of lords to the church so that we might continue in his work of tearing down the kingdom of Satan to build the everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ. And it's by rescuing people out of slavery to sin and death through faith in Jesus that we go about exercising the authority of Christ to set people free from the kingdom of Satan. Matthew 28, 18 teaches us Jesus has empowered us for this work. Third, I want you to understand that evangelism and discipleship are really one and the same thing. It's not sufficient for us to just tell people about Jesus, make converts, hand out tracts, get people to say a salvation prayer. I don't think that that's sufficient. I don't think that's what Jesus is commanding. Jesus intends for us to make disciples who do all that he commands. And one part of obedience to Jesus as his disciple is to do the work of evangelism. So we could look at this two ways. One, if we're not doing this work, then we ourselves are not fully obedient disciples. Jesus tells us do his commands and then he commands us to go. So to be obedient to Jesus, we must go and proclaim the good news and make disciples. Another way to look at it is, if we are doing this work, then every person that we lead to Jesus will become a Christian committed to spreading the gospel, to doing evangelism and discipleship. We might say Jesus was the inventor of the pyramid scheme, the original. While everyone, where where, where everyone who's brought into the organization becomes a worker and the guy at the top, Jesus, gets all the glory. But the point is this, in doing evangelism, we are to make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. 
And if we aren't engaged in that work, we might need to evaluate whether we're really a disciple, whether we really love Jesus to obedience. Because Jesus commands us to go, and if we love him, we'll obey. Fourth, Matthew 28 teaches us that we're to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I think that this is way more than just dunking people in water, although that is important. But long after the water drips off, it dries up and it's gone, long after that, our task is to immerse people in the Trinitarian reality of God, to immerse people in the glorious truth that those who follow Jesus Christ have been crucified with Him. They no longer live to themselves But the very life of God now wells up within them through the Father who loves them, through Jesus Christ who died for them, and through the Holy Spirit who now dwells in them. It's a full immersion into the kingdom of God that we're after when we bring people to Christ, when we proclaim the life-giving truth of Jesus. We're not just inviting people to church as if they could understand all the weird things that we do here, we are inviting them to step into the kingdom of God where Christ is king and his life becomes our life. Finally, I want you to see verse 20 makes it clear that this is a command for us. This is a command for us, for the whole church. It's not just for the disciples. I've heard people claim throughout my life And we actually don't need to obey the command that Jesus gives here because he only gives it to the 11 disciples. They're the ones present, right? But if that were the case, then Jesus wouldn't need to give them the promise that he gives in verse 20. Because in that promise, Jesus says, I will be with you until the end of the age. Well, the 11 disciples are dead now. It's been that way for a while. The age continues. It's still here, the church age. And so in other words, because Jesus promises to be with them until the end of the age, the implication is the people of God must be about the work of making disciples until the end of the age. Not just the death of the 11 disciples present when Jesus said this. And since the disciples are no longer alive to do the work that Jesus commanded, guess who it falls on? Us. We must take up this banner to do this work with the hope and encouragement that Jesus is still at work, still with us, because the work of making disciples passes to every obedient follower of Jesus Christ until he comes back. Brothers and sisters, this call that Jesus gives to proclaim the good news and make disciples, this is the work of the church. Do you understand this? It is why our mission statement at Maricopa Springs is helping people meet and follow Jesus. This is why we're here for the glory of God. And if we love Jesus, we will obey his commands. And if we love the glory of God, We will want every person bowing at his feet, worshiping him for his goodness. But there's still more for us to consider, okay? And this is where I'm going to pepper you because these are the final words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. And I think that begs the question, why in the world does Jesus end his ministry like this? Of all the things that he could have done and left the mic drop, this is it. Why does he close with this? Well, I think the reason is because this continues and brings to completion the arc of God's redemptive historical plan. This is the next step in the story. This is the continuation of the mission that Jesus came for, to make a people for his name's sake. It's the next chapter in the story, which is why Jesus ends on this command. After Jesus has done the difficult, impossible work of securing our salvation, he commands, actually, that the story go on. And the next phase in God's plan where the people of God then labor to take the name of Jesus to the ends of the earth, 
so that every people might hear, that every person might have an opportunity to believe, so that heaven might be filled with throngs of people lifting their voices up to the praise and glory of God. And I don't think this should come as a surprise to us because all of Scripture points to the story continuing like this after Jesus as the gospel of grace then goes out to the ends of the earth. It's all over Scripture, okay? So get ready. Here it comes. It goes back to Abram in Genesis 12 when God promises that through Abram all the families of the earth will be blessed. I'm going to throw it up on the screen. That text says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country. That sounds familiar. And your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abram was blessed to be a blessing so that salvation might come to mankind through the lineage of Abram. And not just the nation of Abram, the Jews, but then the whole earth. And it is so good that Abram obeyed, that Abram was faithful to go, because if he hadn't, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be blessed. And so will we go? Jesus commanding us to go in Matthew 28 is just the continuation of God's blessing to Abram, now passed to us. We see this idea, I think, picked up in Psalm 67. It says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Again, we see the themes of God's global salvation being known among all the people. This is in the Old Testament times. So that all people might glorify God for his grace. It's echoed then in Malachi 1.11, which says, From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. This is God's ancient plan for humanity, which is why Jesus then points it out in his own teaching. Just before Luke records Jesus ascending to go back to be with God the Father in a teaching moment with his disciples, Luke records this. Then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus wants these men, these disciples of his, to understand the scriptures point to him as Messiah, but that also the message of salvation through Jesus Christ needs to be proclaimed. Proclaimed. The evangelistic trajectory of the story of God in saving mankind, I would say is also even built into the very fabric of the temple system. At the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings 8, we find Solomon offer this prayer. He says, likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. And when he comes and prays towards this house, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel." And that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. After this long prayer, and I only gave you a tidbit of it, after Solomon finishes his prayer, the glory of God descends from heaven upon the temple. The people fall on their faces. And God bears witness to the fact that he has made his home on earth 
in this particular location, the temple in Jerusalem. Under the Old Testament temple system then, even foreigners could come from far off to this place to meet God. But something amazing happens when Jesus dies. You know it. The temple, the curtain in the temple, is torn in two from top to bottom. This, temp- or this curtain that separates the glory of God from man in the temple, it's ripped in half from top to bottom. And Ezekiel, prophesying about this event, says that he sees the glory of God, the Spirit of God, leave the temple at that point. Well, where does the Spirit go once it leaves the temple? Well, the Spirit goes out into the hearts of Christians to dwell in the hearts of believers. And in Acts, as the story progresses, then the Spirit disperses these believers from Jerusalem to Judea to Sumeria to the ends of the earth then, among all peoples. Okay, the point is this. You're like, I'm I'm tracking with you, Grady. What, What now? Guys, in the Old Testament, people who were foreigners, who were far from God, they had to seek God by coming from distant lands to the place where God dwelt in the temple, where they could find the Spirit of God. But now, after the work of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God Himself goes out from the temple to the ends of the earth, searching out all who fear God and calling to all people to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. But the Spirit of God doesn't do this with some disembodied force. The Spirit of God embodies the people of God, Christians, so that they become His instrument for salvation to the ends of the earth. The power and authority of Jesus Christ resting on Christians so they might go out and seek those who need repentance and everlasting life. The people of God so that they might go out proclaiming the salvation through Jesus Christ alone. Then filling the kingdom of God with those who will sing His praises to His glory forever. Instead of people coming to the temple, we the temple of the Spirit of God go to them. We are the temple of God on feet. And we take the glory of God out to where people are. This then is why Jesus says in John 17, 18, while praying for his disciples, and not for them only, but also for us, those who would come after them, he prays and says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And the storyline of Acts then follows those who are faithful in obedience to this mission. Acts 8.4 tells us, Now those who were scattered, they went about preaching the word. And what's amazing about that verse is, the reason they were scattered is because they were persecuted, they were abused, they were told to shut up or suffer punishment, and their response to persecution and threats and opposition is to Proclaim the glory of God in Jesus Christ, to remain faithful to Him alone, to carry on the mission that He gave them. It was that important to them. Sharing the gospel, no matter the personal cost. And because they were committed to the glory of God and to the obedience which Jesus had called them. This is why Paul then says towards the end of his ministry in Acts 20, 24, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. O Lord Jesus, if only more of us felt that kind of conviction for your gospel of grace to bear fruit among lost people. That we too would not count our lives of any value except to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Lord, 
Would you change us so that our hearts too burn with this same conviction and this same desire for obedience? Let me wrap it up with this. You're like, I thought that was the end. Psych. I'm sorry, I just couldn't get it into a shorter period of time. So let me wrap it up with this. Guys, it is our joyful responsibility as Christians to share the good news with lost people, to do evangelism, to make disciples so that heaven might be full of those who proclaim the glory of God. So a few hard things for you to consider. If we don't participate in this mission, we should not claim that we are truly concerned about the glory of God. Because His glory is the purpose for our sending. If we don't participate in this mission, we shouldn't claim to be obedient. Because obedience is the final command that Jesus gave us in going. But maybe most concerning of all, if we don't feel a burning conviction for the gospel to save more lost people, can we really claim that we understand the gospel at all? The gospel is the good news of our own salvation. I I can't tell you how many times since Wednesday I've told the story of Leanne not dying on the 347. God's kindness to my wife in this ridiculous car accident. The whole story is a miracle of God intervening to save my wife. And so I've told it to everyone as much as I can because I just can't even believe it. In, In some ways, it's my own story of salvation. Little s. God saved my wife's life. And I can understand the magnitude of that. And so I want to tell people this story. It's a good story. Just so the gospel, right? God has saved our lives forever. God has forgiven our sins. God has declared his love for us. And if we don't shout that from the rooftops... Could it be possible it's because we don't understand what that means? If we don't want everyone and anyone to hear this good news of what God has done for, it, for us, could it be because we have failed to really grasp what God has done for us? And maybe as we start this series, the best place for us to start being a blessing is to just repent of our blindness to how blessed we are. Maybe as we begin, what each of us needs to commit to doing just this week is going back to the feet of Jesus like a little child once again, asking him to give us awe and wonder in the salvation that he has brought to us through Christ. That he would open our eyes once again to the gospel that we might burn with a desire to share this amazing story of the cross with others. So that the joy of our salvation might well up in us again, so that nothing can stop our mouths from proclaiming, nothing can prevent our prayers from ascending, and nothing can dampen our hearts from rejoicing, that the Lord has poured out His glorious salvation upon us. And this is his doing, so that we might proclaim the goodness of God to a world in need of salvation. As one church put it, wake up, sing up, preach up, pray up, and pay up, but never give up, or let up, or back up, or shut up, until the cause of Christ in this church and in the world is built up. Let me pray. God, would you lead us to repentance? Repentance of our familiarity that keeps us from being in wonder. Repentance of our pride that makes us sometimes think we deserve to be saved. Repentance of our calloused hearts that makes us uncaring towards our neighbors. Would you lead us to repentance before you? so that we might once again receive and understand your grace and your love and your kindness towards us. And God, would that please be the beginning of a burning passion in our souls 
to raise up the name of Jesus for the glory of God out of love and obedience to Him. Amen.